This is Research Like a Pro, Episode 3, Analyze Your Sources. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the creators of the Amazon best-selling book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist's Guide. I'm Nicole, co-host of the podcast. Join Diana and me as we discuss how to stay organized, make progress in our research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Welcome back to Research Like a Pro. We're excited to talk today about our next step in the process. Hello, everybody. We're excited to talk today about analyzing your sources. So what do you do after you create your objective? So last episode, we talked about how to create the perfect objective to help guide your research. So now what? Well, one of the things that a lot of people don't think they need to do or don't realize they need to do is to go back through all the records that they've already found and figure out all the little details, put them in order, and find the clues that they've been missing. So many times, the very clue that you need to further your research is just right there, and it's been there all along. So Often, I think people, when they're just starting out with research, don't know what to look for in their documents. And then as you get more experience, you go back through and you have those aha moments. Like, oh, I should have noticed that at the beginning. But if you're just beginning in your research, you don't know what to look for. Yes, that reminds me so much of my last project with the Keaton family and just gathering tons and tons of records, but then not actually looking at each one and getting the pertinent data out of it. Right. And I think that sometimes we're just in permanent gathering mode, more and more and more and more records. And certainly one of those records is going to directly say, you know, the answer to our research question, but we may never find something that directly gives us the answer. We may have to put it together through indirect evidence by looking at all the sources. And so Because this is a method, the Research Like a Pro method is what we use to break down brick walls. And they're brick walls for a reason. It's because it's not an easy answer. And so this is such a vital step to go back and see what you found and to really analyze them. So what should we do first? What's the first part of analyzing in this step? Well, you've got to gather all your sources up. So when I say gather... You may have some of your records in paper files still, or maybe they're on, you know, your ancestry tree or the family search family tree. And you might even want to go and call family historians. You know, maybe there is an aunt or grandmother or someone who you know has been working on this family for a long time and see what they've got. I think we make the mistake sometimes of thinking that everything's online. And so really important to dig dig around in our paper files and to contact others in the family who might have things hidden in their paper files that we could use. Yes, that's so true with that Keaton family project. At the end of the project, I found this other researcher who had already found everything that I was looking for, but she is in her 90s and she hadn't put any of it online. And the only way that I could get it would, would have been by contacting her. So do you think I should have tried to contact researchers during this phase, the analyze phase, or maybe have put it in my research plan? What do you think? Well, I think that a research plan is a really good place to put contacting people that you don't know and that you have no idea what they might have, because you you Mm -hmm. could spend a lot of time doing that, but you wouldn't have a good feel yourself of what you already have. So I always like to kind of have a really good understanding of what information I have so that when I contact other researchers, I can sound intelligent, you know, sound like I know I've researched the family and because they're a lot more willing to share with you if they realize you put in some work. So I would generally put that in the research plan. But like I said before, if you have a family member that you know and that you could contact and say, hey, you know, what do you have on this family? I think this would be an appropriate time to do something like that. That makes sense. So if you already have an inkling that somebody in your family or that you know has researched this person or this objective, then contact them for sure during the analyze stage. 
That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And don't forget to look at some of the other, we always think of on, online trees as ancestry trees or family search family tree, but RootsWeb is also a really great place to look for family trees. RootsWeb was there before the ancestry online trees sort of became a thing and RootsWeb is free and it also is a collection of family trees that um, people tended to do more on their own rather than copying. There's still some copying there, but I have found some really, really good original research in RootsWeb postings. So that's actually one of the places I go first when I'm doing a new client project is to make sure that someone hasn't already put out there exactly what I need. I have found entire wills transcribed and put on RootsWeb. I have found really good connections with good sources. So you never know. That's a really good place to go just to kind of make sure you've you've seen what's available already. That's interesting. So not just gathering what you personally know, but what is already known online and among family. Yeah. So gathering requires more than just gathering my own paper files. Right. Because like you said, you know, sometimes it's already out there. And so why not take advantage of others' research and make it a little bit easier on yourself? Great. Okay. Yeah, I do like to look at ancestry trees, but it's often very convoluted and copied and people seem to have just taken a lot of what other people have put up there and it's hard to know where they got it when the source is just ancestry tree. So I like your idea to check Roots Web. And one other good place that is not as well known is on the family search family tree. That is, you know, a big combined tree, but you can go to genealogies on the family search family tree and you can search within individual genealogies. So these would be family trees people have put up through the years that are individual family trees. And so that's another way to find a family tree that was in its original form before it became combined maybe incorrectly. So the genealogies on the family search website is also another interesting place to look. Yeah, I have tested that out before. So that would be under when you go to familysearch.org, you go to search and it's under the search category genealogies. Right. So great. Thanks. I'm glad you mentioned that because I forgot to think of that one to gather from, but that would be a good place. Also, and of course, we'd want to look in the family tree part of family search also. Right. Great. Okay, so what's the next step after you've gathered up all the sources that are online and in your own paper files and your own research? What do you do next? Well, this is one of my favorite, favorite things to do, and that is put it all into a timeline. I think it's so interesting to just put everything together and do it in a um, chronology sort of way because it really reveals interesting things about the family and it can really show some inconsistencies. So first of all, let's just talk about what to put in the timeline. And I like to do this in a Google Sheet because it just makes it easy for me to use. But you could also do it in a table format on, say, a Google Doc or Microsoft Word. Or even Excel spreadsheet if you prefer to use that. Exactly. But I like that format because it just kind of keeps things neat and tidy. And so the things that you, you would want to record, of course, the date and you want to record the place, the type of event it is, and then the source where you are getting your information from. And as you're doing that, you know, you're going to look for some things like, are these dates making sense? Or is there a child who was born supposedly, you know, when the mother is 55? So the nice thing about a timeline is it really helps you to check dates and make sure that everything makes sense. Because sometimes we just skip over those things in our family tree. We don't really take the time to check. And this is a great way to actually check for inconsistencies. Yes. Yeah. What about um, when you have multiple sources for the same event, like birth, and you have, what, which source would you put for that event? You know, sometimes I like to actually have like a separate row for each uh, source. So let's say you have got birth dates all over the place. Maybe you've got a birth date for 1895, and then another source gives 1890, and another one's 1905. And so you've got this kind of big mix of 
birth information. And so you can do, you could do a row for each info, each uh, date. So for instance, you could have 1895, the birth date of John Smith, and then the source for that was the 1900 census. And then you could do a row for the birth date of 1900, and the, the source for that would be maybe the 1920 census. So at a glance, you can kind of see all the different birth dates that have been recorded for John Smith throughout his life, and then you can see the source. And then it will help you to analyze it and say, oh, well, you know, when he was really old, maybe he didn't remember how old he was. But when he's only five years old in 1900, that's better evidence. Great. So not only looking at the dates, but actually analyzing what the dates could mean and where that information came from. Right. Because obviously some sources are much better than others. And we're going to talk about that in analyzing the evidence. But this is a good place to put all those little details down with the actual source so that we can really make a good analysis of the family. So as you're going along, it would be tempting, I think, to, you know, put in this birth information and then put in all these events in my timeline. And then I might have an idea or a question and then I'll go off and search on Ancestry for the answer to my question. Is that what we're supposed to do at this stage or what should we do if we have questions during this analysis. Okay, that's a great point. Because yes, you are going to have so many different ideas once you get going on this. And the whole purpose of the Research Like a Pro process is to stay focused and not to go off, you know, surfing the web for another couple of hours. So what you'll want to do is just start writing down your questions. As soon as you have a thought of something you need to check or something you're wondering about, start a bulleted list of questions in your research project document. And we have um, a template for that. If you buy the book, then you get that template. And there's a place for the questions right there. And as soon as that question is written, you know, then you don't have to worry about remembering it. It's down on paper or it's down on your computer, you know, sheet, whatever you're working on. And then your brain is free to continue moving through your um, timeline. So I like to get those questions written right down. Great. So maybe when I'm looking at this research project document, the template in the book, we could probably make a list of questions and things in the summary of known facts section. And then, or maybe later on in the hypothesis or identified sources. Think of a source that you want to search. There's all sorts of different sections you could put your ideas in, but yeah, it's good to kind of just write it down and then probably search for it later during your research phase. And another fun thing that you could actually do in your timeline, you could add another column at the end of your timeline and put questions there. You know, you could have some comments and say something like, well, this date was kind of questionable because. So you could put your thoughts and questions right on your timeline if you prefer. So there are a lot of different ways you can do that. So whatever works best for how you like to do things, you know, I think that's important that we realize we're all a little bit different with how we like to organize and how our how our brain works. We might want to do things, you know, a little bit our own way. Yeah, I've I've noticed that one of the most important things in staying focused is that whenever I have a thought or a question, instead of immediately going and looking it up, but just writing it down instead, it helps so much. So that's a good advice. All right. So one thing I just thought of is you had mentioned chronology. So I know that sometimes when you're doing projects, you make a timeline and a chronology. So what is the difference? Well, my timeline is a little bit, well, first of all, it is in the table or spreadsheet format, and I don't do a lot of analysis on the sources, information, and evidence on the timeline. I do that sort of just briefly, but sometimes I really want to go in depth on the sources and the evidence, and so I will do a chronology where, say, I maybe do a little image of the source, and then I do you know, quite a bit more analysis on what kind of a source this is and what kind of information can I get from it. So it's just a little bit different format. It's a chronology. So I might start with an individual's death record and go backwards or start with their birth record. So, you know, whatever 
whichever direction I want to go. But it just gives me an opportunity to analyze the evidence a little bit more thoroughly with the chronology. So it's an alternate, it's an alternate sort of method to help you look at what you've got for an individual. So you're saying basically a chronology is a document. It has more um, writing and analysis. And then a, your timeline is usually in a spreadsheet and it's a little bit more succinct. That's right. Yeah. Something I can just look at at a glance. Yeah, that's interesting. I This last project that I did for a client, I put, I created both. I did a timeline and I created a chronology because sometimes there's just a lot of information that you want to go over. Right. Yeah, some sources are pretty simple, and so they they can just fit right into the timeline. And then others are very detailed, and you want to have a little bit more explanation about them. And so, you know, each project is a little bit different. And so I think that kind of thinking through your project will help you to know what you should do, whether you want to do one, just the timeline, or just the chronology, or both. We just have to really think about the project and what's needful. Going back to the spreadsheet, and the timeline. You've talked before about color coding. So tell me why you do that. Oh, I think it's just fun to do color coding because who doesn't like color, right? (laughs) And I like, um, I think it's kind of fun to color code by event. So when I was doing a timeline, the first time I actually did a timeline for a project was I was researching my Schultz family and it was for my four generation accreditation project. And I knew I needed to do some church records, but they moved around in Indian territory so much. I just had no idea like what county to even start with for church records. And so I decided I better do a timeline. And I had so many different sources. I had three different histories from grown children of the family, you know, done in the 70s, and this was their moves in the early 1900s. I had some census records, and nothing really lined up. You know, sometimes when individuals are interviewed or write histories many years later, they use place names as they remember them, not as the place names were at the time. And so the place names were really tripping me up in my research. And so I put everything into a timeline, and it helped me just to see this family's movement so much better. So in that case, I used color coding to just show all the moves. You know, maybe I did it in green. I can't quite remember what color. And then you could do vital records all perhaps in blue. You could do um, land records in brown, you know, whatever, whatever suits your purpose. But that just helps you, you know, at a glance to see what you've got, what kind of a record it is. And, you know, I think we ought to have some fun with our family history, too. And if we have the capability to add color why not add color? (laughs) Great. Yeah, that makes sense. What did you eventually find out about that family? Well, it was really kind of fun because I found out that they actually stayed in one location and that the histories were right. The one location that was a little bit off was the census. And often we think about the census as being, you know, this is where the family was. This is really good evidence of their residence. And that's true for that particular day that the census taker came and, you know, recorded the family's information. But in my family's experience, they were only in this certain county for a very short period of time. Maybe they even only moved down for a few months and then moved back to where they really were most of their lives. So it was kind of a good lesson for me to realize that we have to realize that census is just a tiny snapshot of time and it doesn't represent the family for that entire 10 years until the next census because we tend to think that don't we you know they were there they must have lived there all those years and in reality we have no way of knowing unless we do have some other sources so that you don't look in that place for the church records because they only live there for a little while Exactly. There was no reason to contact anybody there. So I just contacted the historian of the county in the county they actually lived in and found out that there were no church records. You know, nothing had been saved from that period of time. So I put that in my research report and then it showed I'd really done reasonably exhaustive research by checking for church records. Great. All right. So after making our timeline, possibly doing color coding, what do we do next? Well, 
you've got all your records in your timeline, you've got it color coded, and now it's time to start analyzing it, what you have. And so I will just take one source at a time, and I have a column for sources, information, and evidence. So let's start with sources. Let's take, for instance, that census record. And I would look at that and I would think, is this an original source? Is this derivative or is this authored? And after doing some real thinking, maybe I have to search a little bit more about that source. Then I would just put that, whatever I decided it was, in the column. And in the source of, in the um, example of a census, it was an original source. It was, a, it was an image of an original census. So I just would put original in that column. And then I would have to look at the information. And because it was a census from 1910, and there's no way of knowing who gave that information, I would just have to put undetermined. If it was primary information, that would be firsthand knowledge of, you know, I would know who was giving the information. For instance, if there was a little note that said the head of household gave the information, then maybe I would know, be able to put primary. Um, but in a census, we don't know who the informant was for many of those years. And so it's undetermined, all the different information. The one inf bit of information from a census that is primary is the residence. So that we do know. And so if we are breaking apart the census records as part of our timeline, it, we might have primary information for the residents and undetermined information for the ages of the family. Does that make sense? So because the informant on the census or the residents was the census taker, then we can conclude that he was an eyewitness to their residents. Is that right? Exactly. Because he was assigned to go out and get all the information for the people in a certain area. So we can conclude that that is, like you say, eyewitness. He knew those people were living in that area. And so that would be primary information. But everything else on the census is undetermined unless we know who the informant was. And we generally don't. Finally, by 1940, we have the little circle with the cross that tells us who the informant was. And then we can make a little bit better determination of information. But unfortunately, we don't have that until 1940 for the United States records. So then your last column to analyze with is evidence. So what do you look for in the evidence column? Well, when we're talking about evidence, we're talking about is this directly giving us the answer to our research question, or is it indirectly giving us an answer, or is there no evidence? So it's negative evidence. So let's just go back to our census again. So if we have John Smith as the head of household and his age is reported as 50, you know, then we can say directly we have evidence that his birth year, if this was the 1900 census, his birth year would be 1850. It's directly, I don't know, that's a little thing. What do you think about that, Nicole? Do you think that's direct evidence of his birth year or indirect? Because we do have to, you know, do our calculations on those birth. But I tend to just think of it more as direct because we can all subtract you know, the 50 years from 1900. I think that's direct because you're not combining it with another fact. Well, you are combining it with the fact the year of the census to calculate that information. So I guess it depends on how technical you want to be. <laughs> <laughs> I know. As I said that, I thought, well, that could be indirect. But I tend to think of it more as direct because the question is, how old are you? You know, and they, they give the answer and then we can we can derive the actual date of birth from that. But an indirect, a good example of indirect evidence with the census is when they're giving relationships. So let's say the head of household is John Smith in 1900. And after the whole list of people in the household, there is a Mary Jones and she is his mother-in-law. Well, what can we infer from that? That, you know, his wife, this is his wife's mother. And so that's always a good example of indirect evidence where we have to kind of do some thinking about how how that all connects. Um, negative evidence is simply where someone should be and they're not. So let's say in that same household, there is a child who is um, should be 10 years old. Maybe they were 
three twelfths, you know, in ten years earlier in the census, and then they're in the household and they're twenty years old in the next the next ten years. So as a ten year old, they should be in the household. They're not dead, and they're not there. And so that gives us negative that gives us negative evidence that perhaps um, the child is living with another family. You know, are they being a servant somewhere? Are they with a sister's family, you know, we can use that as some evidence negatively that something else was going on with that child. Great. So that's how you analyze your evidence. Should we go back and dive a little bit deeper into the definitions of source, different kinds of sources? Yes, let's do that. So an original source is the original image, it can be the original document. Much of what we use now are original images. Very seldom do we have an actual document. You know, you might have an an old marriage record that was handed down through the family. You might have a family Bible, something like that. But generally we are looking at images online. And as long as that image seems to be untampered with, then we can say it's original. In our day and age of where we can tamper with images, we want to be careful of something that looks like somebody, you know, did something to it to make it fit their family tree. But I I have never seen an example of that. You know, I think it's something we think about, but I think that would be very, very rare. All right. Well, going back to the tampering, I was reading the book about evidence analysis. I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but he talked about three instances when people had made up source records. And it was about a hundred years ago or something that somebody had been writing a family history and they had created some record that they wanted to add to their family history. So it does happen that people do that. It seems strange. Why would you want to, but you know, people have different motivations. I think that's really interesting. So yeah, we really would want to be careful to make sure. And I think that's why if you notice on the microfilm that they always try to leave the big black edge all around the actual image so that you can kind of see that it came from a book. I think that that's probably instructions to do that so that it's very clear. This is a picture of the actual record. So kind of that's another thing to look for. The book that I was referencing just now is called Elements of Genealogical Analysis by Robert Charles Anderson. Great book. I highly recommend it. He is one of the experts that does the great migration method. So check it out. Interesting. Okay. I need to check that one out. Okay. So let's talk about derivative sources. A derivative source would be an index and think of it this way. An index or a derivative record is somebody looking at the original and then they are taking the information out of that and putting it into a different form. So when family search does their indexing projects, they give the indexers the image and they ask them to take out specific details such as the name, the dates, Um, maybe other people in the record, but there's often information in the original record that they are not asked to take out. And so if you don't go look at that original record, you're going to be missing part of the story. So anytime you see a record and it says no image available, or it says index record only, then realize that there is an original somewhere out there that you need to go look at because the answer to your question Sometimes it's in the original record because the indexer has got the name wrong or they have not noted all the information. You know, we all know how easy it is to mistype. Some of the old indexed, um, like cemetery records, I've seen numbers transposed or I've seen names completely miswritten just because it's difficult if it's not your family member to actually decipher the handwriting at times. Oh, yeah, I have the greatest example of this from my Keaton project. I was looking for Lucinda, and in the estate file of the father who I had hypothesized was her father, there was a name that looked like Drusilla. But when I looked even closer, it was Lucindrilla. So all of the people had previously indexed that or transcribed that as Drusilla. But when I looked at it, knowing that I was looking for the name Lucinda, I saw Lucindrilla. And it all clicked because later on in her life, she went by Cindrilla or Cinderella. So it was it was a great discovery. And it really cemented in my mind that you can't rely on other people's transcriptions. 
Oh, that's such a great example. And so fun with that story, because remember, we found a census record of one of her great granddaughters and her name was Margaret, Margaret Cinderella. And we thought that was so <laughs> fun that she had that name, not having really any idea at that time that it was a derivative of her, her great grandmother's name. So super fun that you figured out that name. Yeah. So derivative. Derivative records can get you in trouble sometimes. Think of them as a finding aid. You know, they are wonderful. We love all the index records, but really think of them as finding aids, letting you know that there is an original. And just a little tip, if you do see one of those on Family Search or even on Ancestry, because Ancestry uses a lot of the Family Search microfilms as their sources, if you see a little um, in the citation where it says Family History Library microfilm and it gives you a number, you can take that microfilm number plug it into the Family Search catalog on Family Search, and it'll take you to maybe the film. And you can actually look up the actual image and look for yourself at the original record. So anytime you see a microfilm number, that's really a great clue that leads you right to the original images. And I have a blog post all about that. So, you know, if you can go on Family Locket and um, just type in Family Search catalog and you know, get a lot more information about how to use that to find those original records. Yeah. And we can do a, an episode later on all about that. That would be fun. Yeah. It's one of my favorite tricks. And I think that it's so easy once you know what you're doing, but it's, it's, it is a little bit of a trick. Okay. So the last kind of source is the authored source and authored sources are where you're, someone has literally taken everything that they know and put it together. So a good example of that is just an online family tree, or it could be a research report that someone has written after doing all their research. They put it all together and published that. There are whole genealogies where people have published, um, you know, everything that they have found. It could be a website a genealogy website for a certain family. Those are all examples of authored sources. And again, if you haven't done the work, you haven't done the research, and you haven't looked at the sources, then you're going to want to give those authored sources, just look at them with a little bit of a grain of salt because you're not absolutely sure about how good that research is. But again, they can be excellent finding aids getting you started. Yeah, just like you said before, finding aid to go find more later. Yep. That's right. Okay. So that was all about sources and we've already talked a little, you know, we went through information, primary information, secondary and undetermined. And we talked about all the evidence. So why don't we do one of our examples from the book? Yeah. Should we do the birth certificate? Part, Dora? So one of my favorite examples of analyzing evidence is from the birth certificate for my great aunt, Dora Christine Schultz. And it's an interesting example because Dora was born the same day that her mother died. Her mother was Dora Algie Schultz, and she gave she died giving, you know, following the birth of Dora Christine Schultz. So, you know, really, the death certificate and birth certificate should have been created the same day or within a day or two of each other. But the birth certificate for Dora Christine was not created until eight months later. And so there's so many errors in it, including her actual date of birth. And you would think that the date of birth on a birth certificate is the best evidence. This is direct evidence, and it's a birth certificate, so the birth date's got to be right. But in Dora Christine's case, the doctor put February 11th, 1925, for her birth. In reality, she died on, or she was born on January 11th, 1925. And the reason I know that is because the death certificate for her mother is dated January 11th, and it was filled out on January 11th. So, you know, Christine's birth certificate, perhaps the doctor realized eight months later he hadn't done it. Maybe her dad said, hey, we need to get a birth certificate. For whatever reason, it has so much misinformation. Almost everything on it, the names are spelled incorrectly, the ages of the parents are incorrect, the number of children in the home was incorrect. So pretty much the only thing correct on the birth certificate was the signature of the doctor and his name. So let's take it through each of the questions. So let's start with the source. What kind of source is this birth certificate? 
Well, it was original. It was an actual image of the original and it clearly looked like it was original. There didn't seem to be any, any sort of tampering, any filling in the handwriting, all, all was cohesive. So it was an original source. But the only thing that we noticed that was not original was that he filled it out eight months later. So we could put that in the notes of our analysis, I guess, because an original record would be something that was written down at the time of the event, right? That would be primary information. So this is where it gets a little tricky because the primary information was her birth and he was a firsthand you know, the doctor that delivered her, he was a firsthand eyewitness. So it was primary information, her birth date. Unfortunately, it was just wrong. He just, it's one of those things we have to remember that memory can be a little bit fleeting, but it was the actual original birth certificate that was made. So even though it was created later, it was her original birth certificate, but the information is is where we have to look at it. The primary information, he was eyewitness of the birth, but secondary information for everything else, because he didn't actually know the ages of the parents. Obviously, they were just sort of guesses. Secondary information about how many children in the home. Again, just he was just guessing. And so, you know, he is his primary eyewitness, unfortunately, with a fleeting memory. So the information was, was incorrect. And then it was all direct evidence. It all answered a question. That death certificate had specific places to put all the information. And he gave an answer to each of the certain questions. So it's all directly answered. We don't have to infer anything from it. But again, even though it was direct evidence, most of it was incorrect. So an, an interesting source. And the one thing that was really important to look at that was the date that it was filled out. And that's what gave me the clue and the, the understanding about how it was incorrect. All right. Can we look at the, the death certificate of Dora now and analyze that one? Yeah. So Dora's death certificate is a little different because it was filled out the day she died. And the other thing on Dora's death certificate is we have an informant. So for all of her personal information, we look at the informant who was her husband, W.H. Schultz. But we also have to remember he just has lost his wife. This is their 10th child. She has just died, leaving him with 10 children. And you have to think, okay, how clear was his mind? How well was he remembering events and information to, to write that onto the death certificate? So again, the death certificate was original. It was an image of the original um, that was created on January 11th, 1925. And the information is a mix. So we have primary information, which was the date of death of Dora Algy Schultz. It was filled out the day she died, so there's no question that that information is correct. What we have secondary information of is when William Houston Schultz, her husband, starts giving information such as her parents' names and where they were born and actually where she was born. He was not an eyewitness to her birth, was he? He just has to re mm -hmm. rely on his memory and what she has told him. And so his information about her birth is secondary. His information about her parents could be primary if he personally knew her parents. And when I found them on the 1900 census, they were living right next to her parents. So I could consider that primary information because he knew her parents. So that one, again, we, we come back to the informant. What does the informant know and how good is their information? So an interesting thing on that death certificate is that her birthday is two days off of the birthday on the headstone for her grave. And so I had to really think about that. Okay, is it going to be better information when they've thought about it, when he's consulted with his children about her birthday or is it going to be better information when he was upset filling out the certificate right after his wife died? 
and I came to the conclusion that the birthday on the headstone was probably better information and that it was, you know, the one on the death certificate was incorrect, just thinking through the situation. So, you know, and we have to remember, we may not always analyze things correctly. We may go back and change our minds with, with more information, but we just do the best we can with what we, what, what is before us and what we're looking at. Wow. That was an interesting example. So we've gone through all the steps for analyzing sources and evidence and information. And um, we've talked about making a timeline and gathering all of your records. So what would be the next step that we'll talk about in our next episode? Oh, the next episode's one of our favorites. Isn't it funny? Every single one of these becomes one of our favorites. (laughs) The next one is the locality guide where we are going to really dive in deep to the locality where our people were living and discover the records, the history, everything that goes into um, researching them. And we're going to get all the ideas to make up our research plans. Next time is all about the locality. Yay, I love that one. All right, well, tune in next time to talk about researching the locality of your ancestors. And we will talk more about how to understand what records were available and the maps and the geography and everything that might be pertinent to your research question. We'll talk to you guys next time. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Research Like a Pro with Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional, and Nicole Dyer. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your own genealogy research. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, or visit our website, familylocket.com, to contact us. You can find our book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist Guide, on Amazon.com and other booksellers. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.